All right, so I guess we can go ahead um, and get started. Um, if anyone hasn't filled out the QR code, please do that now. Um, but hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa. Um, I'm one of the personal finance advisors here at Thrive. Um, this is about my fourth year um, as part of the Thrive team. Um, and I'm Zahir. I'm also a personal finance advisor at Thrive. This is my third semester um, working at Thrive as a PFA. Excited to be with you here tonight to talk about um, some advanced concepts in, invest in investing. Yeah. Yeah, so like Zahir said, this is going to be um, the advanced version. So it's a, kind of an extension from the basics presentation that we did last week. So if you didn't attend that and you're a little confused after this presentation, um, you are actually able to book appointments with either me or Zahir one-on-one. -on -one. We can kind of clear anything up for you. Um, so just as a reminder, we hope all the information that we give you today is super helpful, um, but it is only intended to provide general education. It's not legal investment advice. We're not investment professionals. Um, and again, if you need more personalized recommendations, um, feel free to book a PFA with one of us. And then any of the third party resources that we reference here are not under our control and we're not responsible for those. Um, and we're also not being sponsored by any of them. So just as a brief outline of what we're gonna to cover today, um, we're gonna do a quick review of last week, um, some of the major terms, then we'll give you guys some more vocab that you need to use uh, or that you'll need to know for this session. Um, and then we'll talk about equities, uh, then fixed income, cover mutual funds and ETFs again, um, and then talk about some alternative investing, um, diversification and allocation strategies. Then we'll go over how you actually go about making a trade, and then co cover some common mistakes that are made in inv investing, um, and then give you guys some take takeaways and resources that you can use uh, to get started. So just some basic concepts that we're going to review tonight. Um, we're going to talk about stocks, um, which I'm sure we're all familiar with that. It's just an equity ownership in a company, a bond, um, which is how corporations and institutions go about raising money for projects. Um, we'll talk about a stock index, interest rates, um, and we'll discuss retirement accounts. We'll go through active versus passive management, um, how to divers diversify your portfolio, what the difference is between a mutual fund and the ETF, and the various costs involved with investing. And right, just some so more industry vocab. Yeah. yeah, so the first um, kind of new term that hasn't been mentioned um, in last week's session is a security. So this is just basically a financial in instrument representing the right to receive future benefits under a stated set of conditions. So more simply, this is just stocks and bonds. And if we use this term, we're, we're just kind of broadly referring to stocks and bonds together. And equity is going to be any stock or any other type of ownership interest in a company. Um, it typically is stock, but it could be another way that you're representing ownership in the company and it could be either a public or a private company. Um, and then an initial public offering or IPO. This is the first time that the stock of a private company is offered to the public. So prior to this, the only investors in the company were like management or venture capitalists, uh, but now they're actually raising money on the public market. Um, and so anyone is able to buy shares in the company. And then fixed income, like I mentioned a little while ago would be your bond. So it's any investment instrument that provides a return in the form of a fixed periodic payment. Um, so a lot of times corporations or institutions or municipalities, local governments will issue bonds to shareholders or sorry, to bondholders to raise money for capital projects. Um, so Northeastern did that recently with ISEC 1 and now they did it again recently to start the construction of ISEC 2. Um, so an index, this is the term we did kind of talk about last week, but it's very important. So we're going to talk about it again. Um, it's basically just a benchmark for the performance of a certain asset or sub asset class. So it's basically like a basket of stocks um, that tracks the performance. Um, we usually use, exam for example, the S&P 500 um, as sort of a proxy for the overall market. So as you hear, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, this just shows you the performance of the S&P 500 over time. Um, the reason that we bring this up um, as an example index is just to show you how volatile the stock market is. Obviously, you see a lot of ups and downs over the years, but in general, we see an upwards trend. Um, so that just kind of goes to show you if you're willing to be in it for the long run. Um, historically, the stock market has always trended up. So what should you invest in? So when we're talking about um, getting into some advanced investing topics, these are some, some phrases and some words that you'll hear pretty often. 
Um, so value stock would be any stock that's trending lower um, than its fundamentals suggest. Um, so these are going to be companies typically like Citibank, Exxon, JP Morgan. Um, they're called value stocks because they're trading, their financials are lower than um, the, what their metrics are suggesting. So their revenue, their dividend, their profit margin, um, they may be higher than what the stock price is suggesting at that moment. So investors see this as a buying opportunity. A growth stock is going to be any company whose earnings are expected to grow at a rate that's above what the average rate in the market is. So for these, you can think of companies like Amazon, Apple, they're always growing. Um, they're always expected to be putting out big and better products in the future. So investors are always gonna be flocking to these stocks. Um, domestic stocks would be any company that's based in the US that's traded on a public exchange. So your Microsoft, your Facebook, Alphabet, those kinds of companies. International stocks are gonna be stocks traded on exchanges outside of the US. So the London Stock Exchange, the Japanese Stock Exchange, any of those exchanges. And then we're gonna get into um, market cap. So large cap stocks, those are companies with a market cap in excess of $10 billion. So when we say market cap, that means market capitalization. So that is the valuation of the company. So those are, again, going to be the big blockbuster names that you're hearing all the time in the US. Um, and then small market cap companies are companies with a smaller market cap. So between $300 million and $2 billion. These are your smaller companies. They may still be profitable, but they're not as well known. Um, so it's just a different type of investing um, philosophy that will attract a different type of investor. All right, so here are just some key metrics um, that you can look for when you're analyzing an equity. Um, so the first is EPS or earnings per share, which is pretty self-descriptive. Um, it's you take the company's earnings or their revenue um, and divide it by the number of shares that they have outstanding. Um, this metric is really important um, kind of as a gauge of performance. So oftentimes you'll hear um, like when a public company has earnings upcoming, um, analysts will release their estimates of what they think earnings per share is going to be. And then depending on how the company actually does and what they actually report for earnings per share, you're going to see really either huge jumps in the stock price or drops in the stock price if they beat or do worse than these, this estimate. Um, so it does have a pretty big effect on the overall stock price. Um, and then the PE ratio uh, is the price to earnings ratio. So it's stock price divided by this earnings per share. Generally, this is used to show whether a stock is sort of overvalued or undervalued, but it's really only useful in comparison to other stocks. It's not really useful just on its own. So you would compare the PE ratio to similar companies in the industry and kind of see how it compares. Um, but looking at two totally different companies and comparing their PE ratios isn't going to tell you a lot. Um, they need to be kind of similar. Um, and then enterprise value divided by EBITDA. Um, this is basically um, taking the net worth of the company divided by its earnings. Again, this is um, a multiple that's used kind of um, for comparison within the industry to see how valuable a company is. Um, and then the debt to equity ratio, this is also known as the leverage ratio. It's basically the company's total debt um, to its total equity or the its fixed debt investments compared to its equity investments. Um, this is important because if anything happens to the company, the debt investors are going to be paid first. So if you're an equity investor, if this ratio is higher, it's a riskier investment to you. Um, and then beta is basically a measure of stock volatility. So a beta of one tells you that the um, stock price historically has moved along with the market, like almost equal to the market. Um, if you have a beta of less than one, it means it tends to move less than the market moves. And this means it's a, risk, a less risky investment. And if it's greater than one, it means that it tends to move um, up and down a lot more than the overall market. Um, and so it is a riskier um, option in that case. Um, and then a dividend yield, um, basically this is the dividend amount that a company might pay quarterly as a percentage of stock price. So what a dividend is, is um, you know, every quarter a company might pay um, like a dollar per share to its investors, for example. Um, and so the way that you would calculate this, obviously, is take that number out of a percentage of its stock price. This isn't generally the main way you're getting money as an investor because the dividend amounts tend to be pretty small, but it is something that should kind of go into your calculation. Now we'll talk a little bit about the different types of fixed income. Um, so when you're getting into buying and selling bonds, there's some things to keep in mind. Um, there are corporate bonds, which are issued by public corporations. There's also municipal bonds. Those are issued by governments. It could be at the federal level, um, it could be at the local level or at the state level. 
Um, so these are just different kinds of bonds that are uh, different investors are going to be attracted to either government bonds or corporate bonds. And then when you're looking at bonds, um, you have to keep in mind the credit rating. So there are three credit rating agencies that rate these bonds. It's going to be Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. Um, and these ratings are going to range from AAA to D. Um, so when you're looking at credit ratings, obviously the higher the credit rating on the bond, the less risk that you're taking on. Um, but the flip side of that is if you take on less risk, the coupon rate on the bond is going to be less. So you're not going to make as much um, of a profit as buying those bonds from a corporation or a strong government. Um, you'd be making more, but taking on more risk by buying junk grade bonds usually, or from or buying bonds from a riskier corporation that has a riskier, um, a riskier balance sheet. Um, so just keep that in mind that a lower credit rating usually means a higher yield. Um, and then there's other financial, other types of fixed income that you can get into. There's convertible notes. Um, so with that, you can think of, um, you have a friend with a startup, you're giving them um, some money to get the startup off the ground. Um, they're using that money to invest in the startup, but then that money that you put into the startup represents now an ownership interest for you. Um, so the money you're putting in becomes your ownership stake in the company. Floating and variable rates. Um, so those are interest rates. Floating rates change um, with the market, variable rates change with the market. So when the Fed adjusts rates, uh, whenever you hear that, you know, the Fed's meeting to change rates, um, that's what that's referring to. So if you have any variable rate loans um, or variable rate bonds, that's going to uh, vary with the market when interest rates are being adjusted. And then lastly, we'll get into CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. Um, so this was a big thing back in the 2008 financial crisis, if any of you've ever read up on that or know anything about that at all. Um, during 2008, a lot of people were getting uh, subprime mortgages, which means they were given mortgages that they may not have been qualified for to actually receive and pay back the debt that they owed. Um, so these mortgages were very risky. They had they carried a large rate of um, large risk of being defaulted on. So what a lot of um, companies did is they repackaged these loans into products and sold them to investors. Um, so the, the benefit with that is if the loan defaults, it's not your problem. It's the problem of whoever purchased that CDO, that, collateral, that collateralized debt obligation. Okay, so now we'll talk about some key metrics to look for um, in terms of fixed income or bonds. Um, so time to maturity, um, this one's pretty self-explanatory. It's the amount of time between now and when a bond matures. So if you um, buy a bond for five years, you'll get your principal back after five years. And so that's the time to maturity. The yield to maturity is a similar concept. Um, it's the total return that's anticipated on a bond if you held it to maturity. So how much would you expect to get in total if you held the bond for five years? Um, and then bond duration, this is basically a measure of interest rate um, sensitivity. So how much the interest rate change it, how much interest rate changes in the market will affect the worth of the bond you purchased, since some of them do have those floating rates. Um, and then call features basically allow the issuer um, of the bond to call or pay off early their bond, um, but this is going to cost them a premium. So since you were expecting to be paid for five years, they're going to have to pay a penalty for, you know, choosing to pay off their loan after two years. Um, generally, you might wanna do this because they want less debt on their balance sheet for whatever reason, um, but they won't wanna, they won't do that in general unless there's like a good reason because they are gonna have to pay that pretty high premium to you. So you as an investor are happy with this because you get like a pretty hefty like payment upfront. Um, and then debt to total capitalization is um, debt in proportion to total debt and equity combined. Um, like we said earlier, the higher the ratio, it means it's a riskier investment because a company owns or owes a lot of people money. Um, so it just makes them riskier. So now we're right. going to talk about mutual funds and ETFs and the differences between those two. Yeah. Yep. So like we talked about last week, um, a mutual fund is basically you're able to buy into a fund that holds a variety of stocks and bonds rather than sort of purchasing them individually yourself. And these can be active or passively managed. So um, someone might go in there and make a bunch of trades and move stuff around a lot. That'd be an actively managed fund, or it might just track an index and that'd be passive. Um, they're also priced at market close. Um, so that means you're not able to trade them during the day. If you wanted to sell out of it, for example, you'd have to do it after market close and then um, it wouldn't go into effect until the next day. Um, and they usually have higher management fees since they um, are like, if they are actively managed, 
since obviously you have to pay someone to do that. Um, and they also have more fees associated with them. They often have what are called front end and back end loads, which means you have to pay um, upfront to join the mutual fund. And then you have to pay when you're ready to leave and get your money back. So ETFs stand for exchange traded funds. So these are mostly always passive. Um, so passive management is better for uh, a buy and hold strategy. There's less um, you know, active trading with that. It's better if you're gonna be holding these securities for a long time um, and try and make a profit that way. Unlike mutual funds, ETFs are priced intraday. So you can trade them just like a stock at any time throughout the day. You don't have to wait until market close to buy and sell. Um, they usually have lower management fees. You're usually paying either 1% or a fraction of a percent um, as a management fee for these ETFs. Um, and they tend to be more transparent than mutual funds. So if you're looking for an ETF to purchase, you'll usually be able to go on that ETF's website and get a list of the stocks um, and other securities that are contained in that ETF. Um, so some common ETFs would be BTI, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. There's also um, ETFs that are sector specific. You can get ETFs that track airline stocks, ETFs that track natural gas and energy, literally whatever interest you may have, there's probably an ETF that you know, tracks that sector and has securities that are contained within. Um, and with ETFs, there are certain kinds that you can um, buy that take, take part in things like short sales, options, and futures. All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, those derivatives. So um, derivatives are basically an asset that derives their value um, from another asset. So they aren't inherently valuable themselves. And so the three categories of derivatives are options, futures, and forwards. Um, we're just gonna cover options and futures today. Um, but options are basically made up of um, puts and calls. And so the reason they're called options is you have the option to buy or sell stock at a certain price. So a put is the option to sell an asset at an agreed upon price on or before a specific date. So let's say, for instance, you buy a share of Microsoft today for $50. It's not Microsoft's actual price, but just for example purposes, um, you buy it today for $50, or you buy a put today for Microsoft for $50. And let's say a week from now, Microsoft, something happens and their stock price falls to $40. Well, you have this put now um, that gives you the option to sell um, at 50 instead of 40. So you can purchase that stock for $40 and then sell it for 50 because you have this put. And so then you profit off of that $10 difference. Um, and so calls are similar, but the exact opposite. So it's the option to buy an asset at an agreed upon price on or before a specific date. So same example, uh, you buy a call from Microsoft at $50. But let's say in this instant, the stock price rises to $60. Um, now you have, you have the right to buy it only at $50. So you can do that and then you can sell it for 60 and you profit off of the opposite $10. Um, and then futures are a contract to buy or, some, buy or sell something at a specific date. Um, and this is typically used for commodities. So like a grain and cow farmer could make a contract about you know how much grain is worth one cow. The reason um, <laughs> for that would be obviously demand fluctuates a lot. And so locking in the prices of commodities is, a, is a valuable. Um, and so why use derivatives? Um, typically derivatives are used um, to reduce risk or sort of hedge your bets. Um, you know, if you're heavily invested in Microsoft, but you have puts, if the um, company does bad, it just kind of hedges your bets. Um, and then also some investors like to speculate on future stock movements um, and kind of profit off that, like in the example that I provided. All right, so now we'll get into alternative assets. So I actually took a class on alternative assets um, when I studied abroad at LSE. So these are um, really interesting assets to get into. Um, most of us in this call probably would not be able to invest in alternative assets. You do have to be an accredited investor, um, which means you have to have enough money to get involved in this. Um, so alternative assets tend to be expensive. They tend to, they tend to be high risk um, and they are less regulated than any other investments that are available to the public. Um, which again is why you do need to be an accredited investor to get involved with them because there is a huge risk that you will lose your investment. Um, so some, some different kinds of alternative assets that are available would be private equity. Um, so this is buying an ownership stake into a non-public company. Um, so right in Boston, a great example of this would be Tate. Tate um, has a lot of private equity funding um, by a firm called Act3. So Act3 actually owns a lot of, um, they have ownership stakes in a lot of restaurants in Boston. So they own Kava, they own, um, I believe, Clover Food Lab, um, and the PE firm helps provide funding for this private company to grow um, and expand, which if you've been 
you know, following Tate at all, you know that they've been expanding rapidly across Boston and into DC. Um, then venture capitalists. So these are firms that provide capital to startups um, and early stage companies. One of my uh, internships um, was a startup that was seeking venture capital funding. Um, so there, you, there's a lot of things you have to do um, in order to attract a VC to give you funding. Um, and these startups will try and really attract these venture capitalists to get the funding that they need to get their startup off the ground. Um, and then hedge, hedge funds, these invest in a variety of different assets. They usually have complex portfolio constructions um, and they have a lot of risk management strategies that they use that are pretty complex. Um, and these hedge funds use these, uh, these advanced strategies to generate a high return um, for their investors. They'll use things like derivatives, um, and they'll leverage, um, you know, different different equities in their portfolio in order to achieve these high rate of returns. So some other al alternative assets that are available would be um, real assets like gold, silver, um, any other precious metal. Uh, the downside with that obviously is the storage of these metals. Um, how do you store this if you're keeping this? You can't just keep gold bars in your house. Um, and buying and selling them is not the easiest thing either. Cryptocurrency, um, this was a big thing a few years ago, not as popular anymore, um, but still an option as an alternative asset. Um, and then real estate, you can either, you know, go out and buy a building or a house as a real estate investor, or you can get involved in a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. Um, so this is just a pool of, uh, pool of investors' money um, that's used to purchase real estate in different markets. Um, and again, these, these assets are not recommended for beginners. Um, you, as an investor in this call, you could get involved in, in real estate investment trusts. Um, and in trading real assets like gold and silver and even cryptocurrency if you want. Um, but the other ones that were on the previous slide like VCs and private equity, those unfortunately would not be available to you unless again, you are an accredited investor. Okay, so this slide um, looks very overwhelming, um, but basically what it is is just showing um, asset class performance um, in a variety of years since 1997. Um, and basically ranks the performance from best to worst. Um, and so as you can see, um, it fluctuates a lot year over year. There's gonna be some asset classes that are obviously just inherently more risky than others. Um, but obviously there's some years that an asset will do the best and then it'll do the worst the year after. So it just shows you how um, much this sort of fluctuates. But if you look at the sort of navy colored square, um, that's the diversified portfolio. So that's if you have sort of a combination of all of these types of things. And as you can see, obviously it does vary, but it varies substantially less than any other asset class does. It, it hovers primarily towards the middle. So that just kind of shows you the value of diversification um, that kind of being involved in all of these helps you be able to predict performance and, and make overall just decrease risk. So as you get further in your investing journey, you're going to have to kind of decide what kind of investor you are. Do you want to take a conservative approach, a moderate approach, or an aggressive approach to investing? Typically, the younger you are, the more aggressive you can be with your investing style. Um, and the closer you are to retirement, the more conservative you're going to want to get just to help mitigate your risk. Um, so let's look at an example on the left. If you're a conservative in that investor, for example, um, you have a, a bucket of money, let's say it's $1,000. 15% of that you may put into large cap stocks. So that would be your Apple, your Facebook, Microsoft, those kinds of companies. You may not put any into small cap stocks because those may be a bit more risky. Um, you'll, you're choosing to put 5% into international stocks to get that international exposure. Exposure. You're keeping 50% um, in fixed income. So those are your bonds, corporate bonds, municipal bonds. And then you're choosing to keep 30% in cash. Moderate, um, that's where a lot of people tend to fall in this moderate allocation. They're going to put maybe 35% in large cap equities, 10% in small cap stocks. Um, they're increasing their international exposure to 15%, um, reducing their fixed income exposure to 35%, and reducing the amount they're keeping in cash to 5%. And now aggressive allocation, this is where a lot of young people tend to find themselves. Um, they're putting half of their money into large cap stocks, 20% into small cap. Again, increasing their international exposure. exposure. They're not putting anything into bonds, um, and they're keeping 5% in cash. So if you look on the right hand side of your screen now, on the conservative side, um, if you did a, 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 an asset allocation like this um, with the conservative allocation, in your best year, you could have a 31% upside, um, but you could possibly lose 8%. But if you look on the right, far right side of your screen, if you do the, the aggressive allocation, in your best year, you could possibly have a 56% upside, but your downside could be possibly 36%. 
So you kind of have to decide where you want to fall on this, um, this al asset allocation. Do you want to be more conservative, um, take on less risk, but maybe make less of a return? Or do you want to take on more risk and possibly have more risk of losing your investment? So that's kind of up to, up to you to decide. Yeah, so next we're going to cover how you actually um, go about making a trade. Um, but first, I just want to say if anyone has questions, I know this presentation does not have a ton of pauses because it's just a lot of content. Um, but if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll, we can stop and answer them. And we'll also take them at the end. So, but yeah, feel free at, at any point if you have a question, uh, let us know. All right. So um, we're going to first cover some trading terminology um, that you need to know. So a market order um, basically is a request by an investor um, through their broker or their brokerage service um, to buy or sell a security at basically the current market price. Um, so this is the most common um, order that you're going to place. Um, but there are different types of orders that exist that allow you to be more specific with how you want your broker to fill your trade. So when you place what's called a limit order or a stop order, you're telling your broker that you don't want the market price, the current price that the stock is trading, but you want your order to be executed when the stock price moves in a certain direction. Um, so just as an example, let's say um, that a stock is currently trading at $55. Um, if you place a limit order and you're looking to buy a stock, um, so it's $55. Uh, you want to buy the stock, but you're waiting, um, you're hoping that uh, the stock price will fall to $50 and then you want to buy it. So if you place a limit order at $50, your broker won't fill it until the stock price falls to $50. And then on the other hand, let's say you already own the stock um, that is currently trading at $55 and you're looking to sell it, but you want to wait until it hits $60. You can place a limit order at $60 and the broker won't execute that trade until the stock price rises to 60. So this is just kind of nice if you're looking for a specific price and you don't want to sit there all day monitoring to see when it hits that price, your broker can essentially do this automatically for you. Stop orders, on the other hand, will activate a market order once a specific price has been uh, met as well. But the way I think about stop orders is it prevents you from losing more. So let's say again, the $55 example, um, you're, you want to buy a stock, you're hoping it's going to go down, but instead it actually starts going up and it hits $60 and you have a stop order at 60, which is basically saying you were hoping it would go down, but you don't want to continue to miss out more on the stock price on the stock that's appreciating. So your broker will purchase it for you at $60 so you don't continue to miss out. Um, and then on the other hand, um, let's say you own the price, the $55 stock. You're hoping obviously that it's gonna rise and you can and make more of a profit. But let's say that it starts to fall instead and you have a stop order in place at $50, prevents you from losing any more money, your broker will execute that trade at $50. Um, just in case, you know, the stock continues to plummet, you have this in place sort of like to hedge your bets just in case. Um, and then time and force, this is just basically refers to how long the market order would be outstanding if your broker can't fill it immediately. So most of them that you're going to see as day, which is it's canceled at market close if it wasn't able to be filled. But there's other ones like good till canceled 180 days. Um, and, and there's a bunch of those, but most commonly you're just going to be using probably end of day. Um, so here's just an example of what a market order looks like. Um, so this is for Hercules Capital stock um, that's currently trading at $12.82. In this example, that's not the current stock price, I don't think. Um, but in this case, the person's selling shares that they already own. Um, it's just a normal market order, as it says right there. It's not a limit or a stop order, so it will be executed immediately. Um, and this is the time and forces day. So for some reason, the broker wasn't able to fill it. By the end of the day, it would be canceled, but there's no reason that they wouldn't be able to. Um, and so another thing to point out here is this commission that they're paying on the trade of $4.95, which is pretty high. Um, a lot of brokerage services don't have commissions anymore um, and you're able to kind of trade without paying those commissions, but it's just something to note um, that you wanna make sure you know what you are paying on each individual trade, because if you are paying a commission, obviously you don't wanna be buying and selling and, and placing these orders all over the place because you'll be racking up a lot of fees. So watch lists are a great feature um, that a lot of brokerages offer. 
Um, these list lot let you um, select a bunch of stocks from companies that you're interested in watching um, and it keeps them in one place for you. And this allows you to you know, track the price movement of the stock. Um, it lets you see the trading volume for the day and any other trends that may be happening. Um, and when you see all, of the, all this information in one place, it helps you make a decision more easily of whether or not you want to invest um, in a particular security. So most brokerages do offer this feature and it's definitely something that we recommend taking advantage of. Advantage of. It's time for our bonus question of the night. Yeah, so if anyone answers this correctly, if you are anywhere near Thrive in the next few weeks, um, you can stop by and pick up a free shirt. So uh, you can feel free to unmute or answer in the chat. So the question is, um, what is short selling? So if anyone has seen the movie, The Big Short, this is obviously the focus of it. Um, if anyone has any guesses, um, you can type in the chat or unmute yourself. I know this is like kind of a long definition, so, or like kind of a complicated topic. So I'll like give you a second. Um, if you don't know, as here will explain on the next slide. No. Okay, so someone says, Borrowing the stock at a certain price point and then selling back to the market to collect the difference. Yeah, and then Jesse says, selling shares you don't own yet. Lassia says, is it when you borrow someone's stock and then sell it with the intention of buying it when the price drops? Yeah, so selling stock you don't own and buying it back. Yeah, so a lot of people understand the concept, so that's good. Um, I'll figure out who did it first and yeah, <laughs> we'll figure that out yeah, later. So so short selling um, is essentially betting against the market. So you're borrowing a stock from your broker. So it could be Fidelity or whoever. Um, you're selling that borrowed share in the market at a price and hoping the stock price goes down. And then you're going in again and rebuying that stock at a lower at the lower market price um, and then returning it to the broker and hoping to make a profit from that, that difference in price. Um, so a lot of people will try and do this. Um, it is kind of risky especially um, if you don't know what you're doing. So this is more of an advanced investing concept um, to get involved in short selling. So some common mistakes that we see uh, when people are getting into investing um, is one borrowing money to invest. You should only invest money that you actually have saved um, that you don't need right away and you have set aside to actually invest. Um, over trading is another thing, um, especially if you are using a brokerage uh, that charges com commissions. A lot of them are no longer charging commissions, which is great for us, um, but you shouldn't be, you know, trading every minute. Um, you should, you know, really look into your, into your trades, make some informed decisions um, and not just kind of go with what's popular, whatever security is popular. Um, and that kind of goes into overconfidence. Um, you know, we saw this a lot in early March, April with the Robin Hood traders, um, losing a lot of money in the market and day trading. Um, you know, getting overconfident with their abilities and not really looking into the deeper financials of the company um, and just kind of going with what's popular. Um, you may have some good luck with this, but it's not going to turn out well all the time. Um, and you're setting yourself up for, for losses if you're, you know, not doing your research, um, not diversifying your portfolio. So you're putting all your money into one stock. Um, that's never a good idea. Um, even if it's, you know, the greatest company in the world, you want to diversify across different companies, different sectors. Um, maybe even different markets, um, get some international exposure to stocks um, or other securities. Um, this just helps diversify your risk. If one sector is not doing well, maybe another one's doing better and it'll help kind of, you know, mitigate that, that play in your portfolio. Um, taking risks to recover loss. Again, you know, these are unnecessary risks that you can avoid um, just by doing your research. Um, and then, you know, doing too much too fast kind of goes into the same. Make sure you're doing your homework before you get involved in these things, especially with the more advanced um, securities and products that are available to buy and sell, and then investing in securities you don't understand. So maybe when you're getting started, don't go out and start short selling. You know, buy an ETF, buy something that you understand first before getting involved in some of the more um, risky things. Okay, so some major takeaways um, from sort of this week and last week. Um, you have to first figure out what kind of investor are, you are. So are you going to be active or passive? Are you going to be checking your portfolio and making trades every single day? Are you going to kind of just buy and hold and um, just check it every once in a while? Um, both of those are perfectly okay, but you have to figure that out um, before you go in. The same thing goes for your risk tolerance. Are you willing to take a lot of risk um, to potentially have higher reward? Or are you the type of person that would rather, you know, 
be more sure of your investments and, and just keep it lower risk. And again, this is going to kind of depend on where you are in your life, um, but it also has to do with like who you are as a person. So you have to figure out all these kinds of questions um, before you actually get started. Um, and then second, determine your investing goals. Um, again, this should happen before you get started. Do you have short-term and long-term goals? Um, are you just focusing on retirement? These are questions you have to kind of answer because the types of things you invest in um, are gonna make more sense depending on your time horizon. Um, so you need to know what those goals are going in. And then always thinking about risk versus reward um, when you're investing in anything. Um, again, the riskier it is, the higher chance you have of reward, but the, also the higher chance you have of losing all of your money. Um, so just whenever you make an investment, thinking about um, doing that and thinking about diversifying to sort of spread that risk out. Um, and then understand where you're putting your money. Um, like we keep saying, investing in something that you don't understand um, is just a great way to lose your money. Um, so we mean it in that sense and also know where all of your money is. So don't go put a bunch in a bunch of different brokers and then forget where you have your money, like literally know where your money is also. Um, and then you want to start investing as early as possible. All of you have already done, um, the perfect first step by coming here and learning about investing. Um, but it's a really easy thing to put off and be like, I'm not going to retire for 50 years, so it doesn't matter. But it does because compounding interest is really gonna be your friend if you get started now. Um, you know, The best possible thing you can do is give yourself time. So get started today. Um, and then like we've said, you're gonna have different investing strategies depending on where you are in life. So you're gonna have a different strategy now, probably as a college student than you will when you're a few years from retiring and you have a whole family that's depending on you, um, obviously that's going to um, influence what you decide to invest in. And then lastly, always be asking questions. Um, and as you go through your investing career, there's gonna be so many people that are available to answer your questions. There's so many resources online, but at the end of the day, like you need to be the one that's asking those questions. You are the one that's responsible for your own investments. Um, and so you need to be mindful of that and um, take responsibility and, and look out for yourself. And so these are just some example resources you can use if you're starting to um, invest sort of in, in more advanced things. So for retail investors, these are gonna be things, uh, resources that um, are generally free. So Seeking Alpha is, um, they write about like financial news and um, do analysis on stocks things like that. Um, we always talk about NerdWallet in every single presentation, um, but they have a blog that teaches a lot about um, investing and they'll do comparisons of different funds, things like that. So it's a great resource. Zach's is similar to Seeking Alpha. And then the professional investors side. Um, so this, these are gonna be resources that are very expensive. So you are not gonna, you probably don't wanna go out and buy a PitchBook account, but oftentimes you can get these like through your employer. So like when I did my co-op at Hercules Capital, we had um, PitchBook accounts and S&P Capital IQ. Um, so PitchBook basically is for um, information on a private company. So it shows just like a ton of information um, about who's invested in them and just a bunch of information about the company. And S&P Capital IQ is similar, but for public companies. Um, so again, these are probably gonna be through your employer, um, not you purchasing them yourself. Um, Bloomberg is kind of the same thing. Most of the major, finance companies are going to have a Bloomberg terminal. We are actually fortunate that at Northeastern, we do have a Bloomberg lab. Um, so I highly recommend you take advantage of that while you're here. Um, there are trainings you can do that teaches you all the different things you can do through the Bloomberg terminal, but they have everything from like financial news, um, analyst reports. You can see financial statements of companies. Like it's just full of information. So I highly recommend checking that out while you have that free to you because it is very, very pricey typically. Um, and then Morningstar, Crunchbase, Yahoo Finance. Uh, these are some more resources for like finance news and information. And these are gonna kind of be in the middle where there's like some paid components, some free components, and it's kind of used by both sides, if that makes sense. Any questions for us? I know that was a lot to digest. Feel free to unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat if you don't want to unmute yourself. Um, but we are here to answer your questions on these topics. Yeah. And then if you do need to leave early for whatever reason, we do have the QR code right here for the exit survey. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, um, but otherwise please ask us questions if you have any. 
Yeah, okay. Um, sure, I can take the first one. So she says, when you're shorting a stock, who are you borrowing it from? So you're actually borrowing it from the broker. Um, so like whatever um, you're, per whoever you're like purchasing stocks from normally, it's the same thing, except you're borrowing, borrowing it from them and then you're selling it and then um, you would need to give it back to them later. Um, so then you purchase it again. So it's from the broker. And then here, do you want to take the second one um, just to review what a hedge fund is again? Uh, yeah, so a hedge fund is just going to be um, a lot of, uh, it's just a portfolio essentially where uh, high net worth individuals are pool, will pool their money um, and they'll take advantage of a lot of advanced portfolio structures. Um, they'll do a lot of hedging. Um, they'll do some derivatives. They'll do a lot of, um, a lot of creative investing strategies. Um, and the idea behind this is that they're looking to obtain a return that's better than the market. Um, so a lot of times there's a lot of risk taking that's involved with, with hedge funds, um, but you do have to have quite a bit of capital um, to put into the hedge fund to actually be a part of it um, and take advantage of, you know, the investments that they're making. Any other questions? Yes, we probably have time for the Kahoot. Like early, what do you think? All right. Well, if no one has any questions, I guess we have a Kahoot. We thought we might run out of time for it, but we still have like 15 minutes. I guess, <laughs> um, I think the, so here, if you want, I think the link is in the, yeah. All right, so we're gonna do a Kahoot um, to kind of review a couple of these. It's, it's a pretty short Kahoot, so don't worry, you're not getting yourself into anything way too long. Um, so here, we'll do that. Uh, oh, it looks like the Kahoot is not linked. Is it not? No. Um, oh, wait, no, sorry. The Kahoot is privately linked. So. Um, uh, <laughs> one sec. I think I'm logged into the Thrive Kahoot. Uh, oh, are you? Um, if, if you want to share your screen, then that may be easier. Let me. Sorry, guys. Um, if Also, if you win this, same deal. Um, you can pick up a shirt at any time. I think a hoop might be having issues. Let me see. Okay. It's working. All right. Okay. I think it's working. Let me just share my screen. All right, can we see? Yes. I don't think I shared, oh, wait, let me share it again because I didn't share the sound. Okay, it should be sharing sound now too, hopefully. All right.
right. Al is in first place. So which of the following is not an index? And this one's kind of hard because I know we didn't directly cover that. So. It is not itself an index. Oh, so Thomas takes the lead. Okay, so what is considered a small cap stock? Oh yeah, 300 to 2 billion USD. There are ones that are smaller than that, but those were actually usually be considered like micro. Um, we only covered small and large. All right, Ryan took the lead. So what is short selling? I covered this pretty extensively. <laughs> market. Um, so in this case, you're not buying, you're borrowing the stock. So that's why that one's not right. Um, and you're not trying to lose money, <laughs> ideally. So it's not uh, that one either. All right. Now Cameron's in the lead. We're all over the place. Usually it's like one consistent person, but everyone's doing well. Okay. Um, what is a type of alternative asset? <laughs> But all of these are types of alternative assets. Okay. Three more left. Uh, which asset consistently performs average in an asset class performance over time? So yeah, which is again we didn't directly teach this, but um, based on your knowledge. consistent sort of average performance um, since you diversified away that risk. Nice, Cameron still in the lead. All right, uh, which debt investment grade is the best out of the following options? <laughs> Last question. What is a contract to buy or sell something at a specified price on or before a specific date? It's a mouthful. similar to the put and call, but the key word here is contract. So that's why that is bolded. All right, everyone did pretty well at that. Um, Ryan came in third, nice job. Um, Cameron came in second. And Thomas is first. So I believe Ryan is the only non thrive person. Yeah, so if you want to pick up a shirt, All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, again, like we said, if you have any other questions for us, um, feel free to book a PFA um, and follow us on social media. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.